Glad to be here again with the latest episode of the Hands On Business Podcast. Thanks for all the feedback that you've been giving on over the last few weeks and on the other podcasts. As always, I say, please keep it coming so we can continue bringing you quality topics with quality people. So on today's programme, you're getting two for the price of one. As I'm joined by two experts in their field, you may notice that one lady, which I'm not going to mention her name, it looks absolutely petrified. Uh, I've been trying to get her on for about six months uh, and she only agreed to come on because she's coming on with her friend. So, you know, we're going to be gentle with her today. So Sharon, not saying it's her, but anyway, Sharon, who is the director of Sunrise Senior Living in the UK, but has previously worked as a HRD at Studio Retail, Acorn Care and Education, uh, the co-op to name a few, and she also won the HR Director of the Year. Uh, so welcome, Sharon. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And then joining her today is Emma Cotton, MD of Innovation Central, a learning and development company, and previously Chief Executive at SFL. So welcome, Emma. Thank you very much. So um, on today's programme, we're going to be discussing how to get your organisation match fit for the future. A very apt topic in the current climate as we hopefully start to emerge from COVID. So we're going to be talking about things such as organisational design versus organisational development, for example. So Sharon, when talking about organisational development or design, what do people mean by it? Well, I mean, I must admit, Hakeem, the first time I went into my studio, actually, the last time, when I said, well, we're going to look at an OD programme, a lot of people initially thought I meant overdose. <laughs> But organisation design and organisational development can be used quite interchangeably. Um, and it seems to be a bit of a catch-all whenever you talk OD, seems to be a bit of the buzzword at the moment. But they are two separate things, although they should be thought about together. So if you think about organisational design around the structure of the organisation, how you structure for success versus the broader development of actually your broader business strategy. But I don't think you can do one without the other. So um I have to say over the last 12 months and particularly over the pandemic over what will be now what 16 months or so it's never been so readily on people's mind to think about their structure and think about their business moving forward and making sure they can come out the pandemic stronger on the other side. So. Thank you very much Sharon and obviously because you're a HR director in a business so I know that you'll be implementing that in your organisation. From your point of view, Emma, because obviously you're working across a variety of businesses, are you, are you seeing that same um, pattern reflected across the businesses that you're working with? Yeah, and, and for multiple reasons, Hakeem, as you can imagine. So we're seeing organisations that have found significant growth in the last 12 months as an outcome of the pandemic and therefore thinking how to shape their business for the future. And it's not as simple as just bolting on roles that have already being there or sitting in the structure and on the flip side you've got organizations that have unfortunately suffered from the pandemic and and what we're seeing there is reshaping and resizing to be reflective of their new strategy and the financial targets that they're now achieving so never more have we had to think about organizational design in a way it says actually what do we need to be tomorrow instead of just replicating what we are today thank you and, and, and the same question about I'll, I'll take Sharon first um so in terms of because you talked about when you first stepped in and you talked about OD people didn't know what you're talking about so, so do you find it that you have to convince people to do it the people or the people readily say yeah we're going to change the organization this is the way we need to move forward or is it something that you almost have to convince people is, is important I'd say initially convince um because a lot of people just think the old design bits go straight to the structure rather than actually take a step back and say, before you structure your teams or your functions or your business, what services are there that you want to offer? So what, you know, what can you come and buy from a HR shop? It's either transactional by way of offer letters, you know, the references, especially in care when you need to be DBS checked versus the transformational services of old design, people structures, um, people architecture, longer term strategic workforce planning. Only once you've agreed the service offerings, I would say, can you then shape your structure? And you really need to think about your service offerings in the context of what's your business strategy and where does your business want to go? Does it want to change its organisational capability? Does it need to up its game or dial up or dial down, depending on, you know, as Emma said before, is it contracting or actually is the business expanding? And I think a lot of organisations just tend to bolt on more people rather than stand back and think, right, we are where we are now. How would, if we were starting from scratch, would we really organize ourselves in this way? So, once you get people beyond that, it isn't just diving straight into a structure, 
then yeah, they usually there is a bit of an appetite for it. And you can see, Emma, I think you'll probably attest to this more than me. You can see the light bulbs going off when you start to talk about services of each of the functions. So that takes a little bit of convincing to get over. But once you've started it and the light bulbs go off, everybody wants to get involved because everybody wants to see how these services translate to structure and translate to business performance. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right, Sharon. When you talk about shaping either expanding or contracting, there's a, there's a sense of urgency that every executive wants. So it's very easy to run straight to structure because actually that will give us the almost outcome we're looking for the quickest. And it, it, there's a level of comfort on what they know. And both you and I have seen executives have been highly successful over a number of years, but being made to stop and think around what are the interdependencies between our structures? How do, how do these decisions impact our culture? Because the two things go hand in hand. How are we really going to decommission some things that services that have just been habitual in our organisational structure that actually we don't need going forward? There's, and one of the other things that you look at in a services, Akeem, is when you see all of the individual functions lay out their service frameworks, you can stand back and look, as Emma said, look at the interdependencies. You will be astounded at how much duplication of effort there is going on across multiple functions. MI or data is at least certainly one of them. Um, just to name one uh, where you can think about, do you want that sitting in each of the functions or would you consolidate and centralize those services and then do them even better with real specialist experts? You might do that with some people services. Do you want to leave recruitment sitting out locally or learning and development? Or do you want to centralise that so you can really beef up the capability? But it is quite opening when you have those facilitated sessions and you see the services and you go, oh, I didn't realise you did that. I didn't realise your shop sold that. Um, and actually, what I found useful from HR, because I've been using service frameworks now for ooh, God, probably 10 years plus, What's quite interesting is, one, it lifts the lid off and looks under the bonnet, actually, to what does a HR function do? But more importantly, there are some services, Akeem, that you don't need a permanent structure or a permanent headcount in your structure to deliver. Actually, you come out and get, you know, experts like yourself to come in and, you know, third party deliver some of those services as and when needed. So it's certainly been educational in the businesses I've been in. And I would say that everybody's kind of got on the bus and been really keen to explore their services with their senior teams. Um, and to your point, Emma, there's been some where people have gone, do you know what? You spend all that time and effort doing it. We're not interested in getting it anymore. So you can free up, you know, capacity to do other things that people actually need and want. And you're quite right, Sharon. But I think the value that we've, we've both collectively seen and individually in different organisations is it really encourages executives to think enterprise wide yeah. rather than just a change within their functional area. Um because without connecting those interdependencies, we can do role impact assessments, we can do it people impact assessments, service impact assessments, but we need executives to consistently look across the enterprise and say, actually, how do we move the organisation forward together rather than just the specialism that I'm accountable for? And, and where, where does that generally sit, that organisational design, organisational development? Is that not, would you see that as a HR function? Um. I think it's HR facilitated, mm -hmm. but I've always made the CEO the sponsor. I think they have to be they have to be the honest broker. So I can arrange either Emma to come in, Innovation Central to come in, an independent to come in and facilitate it or project manage it. I try not to be the sponsor of it because at the end of the day, I've got my own function that's part of the jigsaw in the mix. And I think a CEO has to own it, especially if you think those services and the structure and as part of doing the work, you know, if we think of culture as the sum of behavior, what you get out of this piece of work is actually what are the behaviours that are going to drive your business forward. I absolutely think the custodian of that has to be the CEO. So, and, and you ever get pushback on that? Because obviously lots of people think that HR is just about, as you said earlier, well, we're recruiting, so I'm doing some job profiles or um, you're sacking somebody or et cetera, et cetera. I haven't had a challenge with it, Hakeem, because if you can build a robust enough business case that says here's the methodology, here is the approach, I've now done it four or five times and all of them have delivered business benefits, either through cost savings and efficiency savings to strip out the duplication of effort or really been a catalyst and an enabler for growth really quickly. So when we first did this piece of work at, you know, um, in a house builder, you know, they doubled their sales over two or three years. 
when I think of, you know, studio, you know, it had double digit growth and everybody wanted to be involved in part of the OD because it gave them clarity of accountability at a frontline role level. We engaged the workforce to help us shape it and made sure that even the 90 minute workshops to, to help shape what they did and how they did it. And actually one of the questions I think Emma will, will confirm, we used to ask is what stops you doing a brilliant job? What else can you see that would make that job even better? They had way more insight than we ever had. So norm, I have to say of all the business cases, you know, studio delivered a million pound of benefit. You know, if you people are clear on what they're doing and they've got career pathways, makes it easier to attract, easier to retain, you know, and one, I'm not a massive person for analogies, but I try to use this one from a HR perspective. It's easy when you can kind of compare it to marketing. Marketing's role is to go and attract new customers, maximize the performance of those customers, either through share a wallet or multiple visits, retain those great customers that are delivering great performance results, offload those customers that don't serve you well and don't make you any money. Um, and make sure that they promote the brand. I think if you swap C with customer with C with colleague, I think that's our gig. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in a way, Hakeem, the business cases have always been built robust enough that I've never really had a challenge with it. Okay. Well, I think it's fair though, Hakeem, that Sharon's always had the opportunity to be at the top table and influence at that level. Not every organisation has a chief people officer or a HR director that sits at the top table. Um so to Sharon's point, although HR should be the facilitator with the CEO as a sponsor, every executive is accountable to shape their function in a way that delivers the business strategy. So, OK, then, Emma, in the last 12 months, because obviously you're working across lots of businesses, what, what would you say have been the most common drivers of OD, in your opinion? Most common drivers that I've mentioned it before, but COVID, 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 and a bit more COVID, if we're honest, the team. And... and we're very privileged. We work with the, the, both the public and the private sector. That have, and all our clients have actually been positively impacted by COVID. So we work with a number of online retailers that have seen significant growth. We've worked with a number of manufacturing and distribution organisations where their provision has been needed in multiple sectors. Um, so, yeah, growth is, for our client base has been the main requirement for either organizational design or organizational development because as Sharon mentioned previously you can reshape the organization but once you've got that capability in how do we develop it in a way that it actually delivers what we need through performance management leadership development career frameworks learning curriculums so there's been a real long list of requirements from our clients but what we're seeing is the requirements at pace because the change is happening so rapidly so we're not seeing really long time scales for RFPs it's we have a need we have a budget we have an objective we need to do something that delivers with impact so um yeah our clients have very much benefited from a lot of the the change in the last 12 months yeah no I was was just going to say because it's it it would appear to me that actually having a robust structure with people who are developed on a regular basis, even before COVID, puts you in a better position to deal with these sorts of challenges, doesn't it? Because I think the businesses that do well are the businesses who get it and are geared up, and as you just said there, are, are quick to move as they see changes because they realise, well, actually, the way that we are currently functioning is not actually fit for purpose in the the business world that we're moving into. And COVID, I think, is a perfect uh, example of that so, so have you seen the same Sharon has, has your business changed to to deal with, with with obviously the massive impact that's happened over the last 12 to 15 months definitely and if you think about it in a residential care home setting you know the head office support office could all work from home now that was a massive culture change because they'd never done that before but the frontline communities which we've got just under 5,000 colleagues supporting about 3,000 residents it's pretty much the same for them, but we had to quickly turn around recruiting about 700 people in about seven weeks. So that's where, you know, a kind of new org design pretty much quickly implemented. Emma came in and helped us. We moved to online um, screening, video interviewing, video um, and online induction processes, as much as anything to mitigate and minimise infection getting into the site so that we could absolutely hire the best people and in some ways I've got to say Hakeem centralizing it and having that kind of 
holy moly, oh my God, we're, you know, maybe 20% of the workforce are going to be self-isolating. We've got to find nearly a thousand people. I would say because we were already starting on the OD program, we already had a bit enough in, well, certainly enough insight. I started in the January, Emma started the work late December, January, just before I started. We had enough insights that we could move quite quickly on it. And our recruitment's never been better. We've taken our attrition levels down from what would be 35% typical in the market to 25%, which is amazing compared to some other care home providers who we know that they've gone up because people want to get out of it. And then we've doubled our conversion from bank to perm by 100% because we've just game changed how we deliver the recruitment experience to bring people in and on board. So whilst COVID was the catalyst, we'd already started to look at the OD of how could we do things quite differently. The, all COVID did was just, to Emma's point, was just a catalyst to make it go even quicker. And there was a bit of oh, And also what we saw from a recruitment perspective is COVID also opened a lot of talent up as well. Yeah, so if we think about the aviation sector and then what they do in terms of hospitality, although it's in the air, it's great service, it's about attention to detail. We had the opportunity to place some exceptional people that may have never thought about the care industry if this hadn't have happened. So actually the talent portfolio across a lot of our clients, whether you're home working, remote working, We've got some clients that are sort of Bolton based that would never have recruited somebody in Devon or up in the deep dales of Yorkshire. But now we can because we've started to get used to the way that we work in a very different way. And although it's still in a residential setting in, in Sharon's world, some, some brilliant people were attracted to the brand that we may never have seen before. Yeah. I mean, so my head of business partners and people change lives in Ottingham, whereas everybody else before then, Hakeem, would have been based in Beaconsfield. Mm-hmm. You know. yeah, no, I, I think the, the moving online and that becoming almost a norm has, has been a bit of a game changer. And I was just thinking, you know, you, you, you recruit over what seven over seven hundred people, and so it's, it's almost kind of counterintuitive that you would get that you would actually have a, a lower attrition rate. So, what was this? What do you think was that? Take aside the fact that obviously you've got some great, great people, and take aside the fact that you two are doing it. Obviously, um, what would you think were the, the key things that um, sort of like what would the game changers that meant that you actually believe that you're now doing better recruitment than you were before i don't think we did recruitment well before i think people used to come in and have an interview you know we have we have some brilliant general managers who know intuitively and instinctively who's going to be a great carer but it was by gut whereas really making the process more robust so having a first initial screen at a contact center who would ask you some values-based questions then coming through to another interview, which would be one of the team or one of the Innovation Central team, because we just needed to get third party support because we just are too many. We were never going to do it ourselves to then do really structured behavioral interviews to make sure we were getting the right people in the first place. Then as part of the induction, moving that online and making sure that it was delivered consistently by one of my training team rather than maybe it may be hit or miss if you got on a community but it was busy or there was an outbreak or something happened. So there was a lot more structure and a lot more rigor. Um, some people may also say, you know, it's the COVID factor. People might not want to move on. Um, I certainly know our US counterpart, their turnover has doubled in the same period ours has dropped by 30%. So, and I know that I'm part of a WhatsApp chat group with other HR professionals and I think it's still around the 30% attrition. So, I, you know, I think it's fair to say it has been market leading, but it's not just the recruitment, I would say, that's made people stay, Hakeem. I think it's everything else that we have done, you know, trained our leaders, managers. We've had a big focus on mental health and well-being and mental health first aiders. We've done loads around the benefits. So I couldn't say it's one particular thing. I think it's a mix of different things that's gone in to the into the mix. And I think that's why people are saying because they feel valued and they feel they're making a difference. In, in the nature of the people that you recruit, they're quite altruistic by nature. And when you think about nothing creates a team more than a common goal or a common enemy, COVID was the common enemy. And you go into communities and you speak to GMs and general managers and their teams and just that sense of camaraderie and care for each other, because not only have they been looking after residents, they've been looking after each other and, and their extended families. So um, there's certainly a sense of wider community that I certainly see within Sunrise and Gracewell too. Okay, thanks. Uh, and obviously, I know, I know both of you guys are very, very process driven, and you're very precise in what you do. So 
if they're and, and Sharon actually mentioned it before, I've done this in like five or six different businesses before, and I've been in one of those businesses where 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 she did that. Two. Oh yeah, I've been in two, but yeah, that's true. Sorry, I've been in two businesses. Yeah, sorry, I do apologize. You want she's to not, forget about the second for some yeah, reason? She's obviously yeah, because I, I didn't get any of the money. That's why. Um, so <laughs> um, anyway, moving on. So um, so the question is: Is there a right or wrong way to shape or design? Um, do you want to say Sharon's way? <laughs> well, yeah, that's always the right way, obviously. <laughs> what I would say as a wrong way is HR doing it on its own, yeah. you know, and just going in a room because loads of HR people think, yeah, I know how to do values, I know how to do org design. I'll just put my, you know, lock myself away in a room and I'll come out. And here's your values, here's your structure, here's what I think. I don't think it's, but I think it's for us to facilitate CEO sponsoring it. And I think the wrong, another wrong way is just doing what you've always done and adding a little bit more on. I think it truly is about lifting the lid off all of it and looking at the service frameworks. And a big no-no for me is not engaging the people who do the job. It's where most of my budget is spent by having those sessions, either one-to-one -one if it's a unique role holder or running facilitated workshops with people more than, you know, if there's like more than one in a role. Because I think they know that job, they know that business. And as well as giving you some of the, you know, the what they do and the how they do it and how, you know, what a great person looks like. And we all know what someone who walks in a door and we all think you're not going to last here two minutes looks like. They can articulate that and they tend to be a bit more vocal. So they give you loads of amazing cultural insight that you would never get if it was HR going out to run those facilitated sessions or if it was the line manager or the relevant exec director going out to ask those questions. People wouldn't tell you. So... I would say not engaging the workforce would be one, but I think a, a, a thing that you should do is I would always recommend using an independent facilitator. I think you get way more insight, you get way more truth. And I think they can ask the questions of, so come on then tell us what it's like to work around here. I don't think people would answer that honestly if the HR function went in and asked it. I also think you become the honest broker of the, the colleagues tone of voice as well, Hakeem. So when you get to, if you think about a standard process that if, from a, a way that we know that work, Sharon, is ex engagement with the exec, definition of service framework, engage with colleagues, current state assessment, really start thinking about what the structure looks like to deliver that service framework and then what key accountabilities need to deliver that and what behaviours underpin it. So what, what do we want colleagues to do and how do we want them to do it? But the how is so important that it's articulated in the tone of voice that the colleague can connect to because we can quickly get stuck into either HR language or very professional terms. But actually, it's not in the words of the people and therefore it gets totally lost in translation to what goes back to the workforce. So for me, the independent person, and Sharon and I have had many of disagreements on this back in the day around, they've got to be thick-skinned or tough. And Sharon said, you mean resilience? Yeah, that's what we mean, but that's not what the colleagues say. And it's really challenging the executive to be able to develop a solution that the colleagues can own and I always say for the people by the people and if you're not doing that change is difficult anyway but if we can we can in, engender that change through actually embracing people in the process you know the top down bottom up piece becomes so much easier so to do well are the ones I always say that are agnostic about where the ideas come from yeah. and where they take you because you, what you're trying to do is improve the business. So if you get an independent facilitator and they're telling you this is what your people are saying and this is where where, where your gaps are, this is where you need to improve, then it's only a, a fool, really, who then says, no, 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 yeah, that's fine, but no, I know my people, I know my business, and we're going to carry on on this way, uh, which, obviously, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen that happen. I, I know me and Sharon definitely have, but anyway, so, obviously... you values. <laughs> I can't go out there. Uh, yeah, well, well, I, I can't, I can't. To be honest, I can't repeat what uh, Sharon's discussing in terms of our wishy-washy certain values that we had uh, one of our um, our senior leaders tell us about. But I use it as a story. So if you if you get me off camera, then I'll give you a full chapter and verse about that particular engagement that we had, which which leads me on to my next question. No, before, around... Just before we go on to that, that one, though, Hakeem, I think where Emma talks about we start top down with the service frameworks. When you start talking about the service frameworks, what it really does is flush out a more strategic conversation about where your business is going. Yeah. 
you know, so come on, guys, if this is what we're delivering and this is what our functions are delivering today, let's fast forward two, three years. What do we think they need to deliver in the future? You know, are we going to offshore it, some of the work? Are we going to onshore some of the work if it's offshore? What are the real core USP capabilities we need to have to be really successful and be market leading? So, you know, if I think of Studio, that was about marketing the product. That was about having really great FS products that it never really thought about itself like that. I it thought itself as a catalog, you know, um, company. So having those conversations make you really hone in. And that's when we thought, right, okay, so if it's product marketing and if it's FS, let's go to market and get the best FS director and the best FS underwriters. And let's go and make sure that we build a marketing capability. And financial, FS, FS for my financial services, sorry. Thank you. Because in that business, um, people bought the product and then took financial services and that's where the profit came from. So it also meant from a reward and recognition perspective, not everybody may have been up a quartile, but you may have chosen to select those functions to say that that's where we need to get the best talent. In some of the other functions, you just need to get good talent. But if you really want to excel, where are the roles and the pivotal roles that you really need to go and get the best in the market? Because it'd be lovely to think as the HR director, we'll go and get the best in the market at everything. But I don't think, Hakeem, you need to be best in class at everything. You just need to know where you need to be best in class. And this OD process helps you flush out and really target and pinpoint where do you need to be better than the rest? Because it isn't on everything. It might not be on HR, it might not be on finance, but it might be on dementia care or it might be on assisted living in my current business. It really flushes out that conversation at a senior level to have that dialogue at an exec whilst running concurrently, we're starting to build the roles from the bottom up. And then you kind of blend that work together and you say, right, this is our way forward. So it's not all top down and it's not all bottom up. I think it's a complementary mix of looking through both lenses to then shape where you want to go for the future. Would be, would you say, Em, that's kind of where it gets to? Absolutely. It's a smoosh in the middle that makes it magic. <laughs> and, and so, because obviously, I mean, Emma just mentioned about uh, people find change hard and people do get disengaged by it. So how, how, how do you prevent it from becoming a disengaging activity and making sure that it is engaging? It's got to start with transparency. But we invite people to get involved, Akeem. So if I think of Studio, out of the 2,000 employees, 700 got involved in some way, shape or form in either a 90-minute workshop or a session of some sort, way or another. Now, you could look at that and think, wow, one in three got involved, that's massive. But I tell you what, by the time it came out, people recognised their voice, their post-its on their sessions going, well, that was my line that I said there, thick-skinned or, you know, um, rogue, you know, doesn't suffer fools gladly, whatever the descriptors were. So everybody felt it was their programme so that when you saw the behaviours framework and you saw the cultural values coming out of it, people genuinely felt the buy-in that they were theirs. And then when you went out and said, we've created this with you and through you and these are in your words, when you then go to market to recruit for those skills or you performance manage against those behaviours, it's a common vocabulary that the whole business is bought into because they wrote it. We just facilitated the writing of it. But it's their words. Well, I'm also a massive believer, Hakeem, of finding the people that are perceived as being the most challenging or disengaged yeah. or, and the most negative. Put them in a room with me. I absolutely love it. Because what you tend to find is they're not disengaged. They just need to understand why. And yeah. while and I just have a really strong view. And while people are still talking, they still care. It's the silent ones you need to be worried about. Yeah, I would agree. Where you get a sense of perceived negativity or resistance to it, all they want to know is what it means to them in a little bit more detail. They've probably heard it 400 times previously in their career, and it's never actually delivered what it said it was going to do. So they just want to share that. But just don't avoid the people that are perceived to be challenging. Get them together and give them a voice and just give them the opportunity because... The minute you've got them, you've got the rest of the organisation. I was just going to say, it's, it's almost, uh, I think sometimes people go into businesses and forget the human. Because <laughs> in, any, in any walk of life, you don't like things being done to you, do you? You like to be involved. So, and, and, and as you just said, there's lots of organisations I've been in where you do, you're about to do an organisational, let's just call it a restructure in this, in this instance. And it's like, yeah, well, three people go into a room start moving people around and say, oh, well, they can work there. They can move to that. Oh, this is the job that they should be doing. And then they just announce it. And then they wonder why they have a massive 
uh, amount of turnover about six months later. And they go, oh, well, well, I thought it was a great structure. And it's like, well, yeah, but you didn't engage anybody. You've just gone off and decided this is what's best for the business without really understanding the business. So, yeah, sorry, sorry, Shalane, go on, you're going to say. No, I was just going to say that you have to tell people why. Yeah. I'm a massive advocate and whatever we do, as long as you articulate why, they might not like the why, as long as you explain and share the why and communicate the why, people usually get it. Yeah. Why do we need to do this? One, we need to make sure that, you know, we are match fit for the future. You know, we can continue to grow. We can continue to attract the right resident, the right, you know, frontline team members to be able to provide amazing care for those residents. So that's why we're embarking on this program to make sure that we are match fit and, you know, we can grow. We can, you know, either through, if that's through new homes or is it through organizing, you know, organizing ourselves better. So, and what is it, what's the why for the individual? Well, the why for them is, well, if you have real clarity about what your role is and what the next step up role is, you've got a really clear career path as to how you can navigate yourself through that career journey. Because we've all worked in organizations, Akeem, where people have got promoted because their face fits, not because of the most capable and not because there was real clear clarity and transparency as to what you needed to do to get to the next level job. So, and then you wonder why you don't keep your people and they go for career opportunities elsewhere. So this is about creating a culture where there's clarity of accountability in the job you're in now, but also real clarity of what you need to do to get to the next level job. And that's through a step up and ask and a step up in accountability, but also tends to be a step up in behaviors and a step up in the skills that go with that. Because you can't just keep expecting pay rises, but not be expected to deliver greater accountability and modify your behaviours and start stepping up and delivering through others. Otherwise, you'll always be an individual contributor. But it also gives organisations, particularly from a learning development perspective, real clarity on the opportunities that they need to create to help people step up. So it's not just about the theoretical clarity of accountability that we see within a role profile or within a career framework if we look at most organizations they use the 70 20 10 model of development 70 percent of your training is on the job 20 percent through others 10 percent through formal training but how does that actually translate in a very clear way for people's career framework career pathways and career frameworks how do managers and learning development functions really create those opportunities for people to pressure test their change in skill and competency before we promote them because you know what so many organizations that I work with are great at promoting to a level of incompetence because what we do is we train them after and figure out that they can't do it so the more that we can pressure test people and what I class is a try before you buy before people start getting promoted we create this safety net where people are exposed to a, a task or activity or a behavioral interaction that they're not comfortable with they can opt out without losing pride and they've still got their current job. So there's something about the maturity of organisations to really think about people's development in a far more holistic way once those frameworks are in place. Thank you very much. And so, so you've obviously Keith. talked about involvement of being one of the key elements to getting it right. So what are the other top tips which you could suggest? To, if you want to get it right, what would the others? Involvement, yeah, we've agreed. So what, what would the other things be? Enterprise-wide leadership and what I class as peer leadership at an executive level. Um, the minute you see yourself as a functional leader and your primary team is your functional team, we failed. So the conversations need to sit around that executive table, the challenge that comes with it. And no organisational redesign should be done in isolation of thinking about the OD impact to everybody else. So for me, that's critical in terms of the, the CEO shouldn't be leading that. Peer-to-peer -peer leadership at that executive table should, should be the catalyst to that. And that's usually how I pitch it, Akeem. This is, we're all in this together. This is our programme as an ERT. Um, yes, I think I said before, the CEO needs to sponsor it. But, you know, I see myself as an executive director first. I just happen to bring to the table... You know, my job is and my number one accountability is to make that business successful, to deliver shareholder return. I happen to deliver my bit through, you know, what dials do we need to shift from a people perspective to maximize their performance? You know, the IT person will be coming to say, right, here are the systems and the technology that we need to dial up or dial down to make sure we can deliver finance and we've got the right finance modeling. But 
first and foremost, I'm an exec. I am then the HR director. And that's the, that's the specialism and the people expertise that me and my team bring. Um, but I think in terms of other tips to getting it right is engage. And I know Emma's here on the call with us, but I think the biggest thing is, is getting an external in to do that initial shaping. Because once we've got that, me and my team can work with the business and work out. So what's the recruitment strategy and all the recruitment um, principles that we'll use and what's, you know, what's the selection methodology? Then my team can design the performance management framework that's going to assess against those behaviours and against those values. My training teams will then be able to plug the gaps from the development as, you know, mapped against the career pathways. So I tend to find that I use an external you know, Innovation Central, um, who partners with the kind of grown using this model. So whilst yeah. the methodology is the same, the outputs are always different depending on the needs of the business. But I invest my money in that foundation, but Hakeem, you know, in terms of getting a real clarity of purpose, clarity of accountability, getting the, o- the OD from an org design perspective, but connected to the org development piece that the exec have shaped through the service frameworks. Once I've got that, everything else can be delivered internally. You know, as I said, recruitment, training, induction on board, performance management, talent reward, all of that is a real easy bolt on once you've got that core strong foundation from which to build on. So, how, 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 I mean, obviously, you sell it in, obviously, because you are the HRD. So um, this is an interesting one from Emma's point of view, because generally you have a HRD in post. And I'm not saying that they're all completely blocked off, but a lot of them see that as their role. So they see someone like Emma as being a threat to come into actually, well, shouldn't I be doing that? Now, I know you're frowning uh, because that's not the way you... Facial leakage, bad, bad facial leakage, okay. I suppose the point is, how how do you, because there'll be people who watch this and think, yeah, that's completely right, but how on earth am I going to get someone like Emma into my business because the HRD believes that that's their role and they want to do it themselves with their team? And if we're really honest... If you think about HR teams, this is the sexy stuff. Why would you want to give it to somebody like me? I'm not stupid along that way. It's the stuff you've trained for. You know, who wants to do ER cases when you can do a really sexy transformation job? Um, I don't take it from a HRD. So my role is to be an extension of capability and capacity as part of the HR team. So it's not my project. I'm here to... I talk about making HR heroes. It's we're there to make sure that HR and their team don't have to do it off the side of their desks. Yeah. We give them the insight. We give them the data. We just get behind the project in a way that is owned. But our primary customer is always our HR director, as well as our, our CEO. But this isn't about taking it off them. This is just around putting a bit of weight and pace behind it so I've not yet met a HR team that's got an infinite amount of time that they're just sitting there and staring out of a window they're usually at capacity they're working 15 16 hours a day Um, and what we do is just really help them focus on what's important and like anything from an engagement perspective if it's taken over a very elongated period of time it loses its impact so we can engage with a lot of people in a very short pace, a very short space of time to get that energy and enthusiasm. And I guess from mine and the team's perspective, we've all had proper jobs before we've done this for a living. So we've been operational leaders. We've had p accountability. We have had teams. So when we engage with people, I'd like to think we can do it from a very authentic perspective that we've been there, done that and got the T-shirt and know the challenges associated with it. So although what we do is is steeped in in theory and in academia to which HR teams like, we're really quite practical and straightforward and straight talking in the way that we engage with people. So it's never our programme. That's a really long way of explaining that HR are always the lead. Yeah. Makes sense. But also, Hakeem, I think it goes back to one of the original points. People will tell an external. They won't tell a HR person. I think my manager can be a bit of an idiot or I don't think the way that we're on this process is particularly great. You'd never get the insights that we get as part of doing this independently, you know, with an external. 
honestly. You just don't get it. No, no, I, I agree. And I think that one of the top tips that obviously Emma mentioned was enterprise-wide leadership. And I think if you have enterprise-wide leadership, people buy into it. I, I think where you get that divergence of thought is when you have probably non-functional leadership teams where everybody sees themselves as, well, I'm the sales guy, I'm the marketing guy, I'm the... Well, no, no, you try to run a business. And if you try to run a business, well, you need these competency frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, to actually drive the business through. And therefore, it doesn't matter who's doing it. And as you just said there, Emma, actually get an extension of your team. Uh, and I have this conversation in, in lots of areas around outsourcing because people say, oh, no, no, I can do it myself. And I, and I find it strange that, that I'm convincing people that, no, you've got a lot of work on. Wouldn't you find it easy to have some help? And they say, no, no, I can do it when I know they can't. Uh, so so that's, that's why I was asking the question. It's not just HR. Um, it's, it's across the piece. But when you haven't got a, a, a high-performing, functioning leadership team, you do tend to start getting these breakdowns in communication. You, know, you, just, you just talked about making HR heroes. And some people think, yeah, but I, don't, I, I want to be the HR hero, not somebody externally, even though that's not what you're going to do. I don't see it like that at all. I see Innovation Central as a bit of an extension of my team, you know, and give us amazing insights back, you know, that I would never get. And we also position it very much when we speak to the colleagues on the front line and we say, do you know what? We're going to put you in a room with Innovation Central. We completely trust you. Tell us what it's like. There's no manager sitting in here overlooking your shoulder. You know, they won't come back and say, you know, Hakeem said or Sharon said or Emma said, but they will come back to us with themes where there's enough of you telling us that we need to do something, we need to act on it. So yeah. actually, we're placing a whole load of trust on you to go in that room and really tell us how it is. And actually, people quite embrace that and they don't, you're not backward and coming forward, are they? Never. <laughs> Never. I've not been in any organisation across any sector where we always feel really privileged and humble, actually, that... People will take half an hour or an hour of their working day and tell us passionately what they think about the organisation, the good, bad and indifferent. But the one thing that aligns them all is they want to work in a great place. They want to enjoy coming to work. They want to feel valued. They want to see their colleagues being appreciated. They want to feel appreciated themselves. And I, I mentioned it before, but even the ones that organisations can perceive as being negative, they really care. They're fundamentally passionate and are just a bit fed up. Well, we can do something with that. We can really help them with that. So, yeah, we've been doing this for many, many years now, Innovation Central, for the last nine years. I've never been in a focus group where we've had silence. <laughs> it's normally the case that we're looking at our watches and we're running out of time. Yeah, we've met some amazing colleagues along the way. So, so to bring it together in terms of people who are listening or watching and thinking oh yeah that's all well and good organizational development organizational design you know what do you see as the key benefits of the program that you've just described well from my perspective i've found it easier to really embed my hr strategy my people strategy so i know exactly what i'm going to market to recruit for so I know the best, um, we can deploy the best um, tools and techniques and processes to get the right people, depending on what those behaviours, values and skill set are. I think once you know what that job is and what it needs, you know then to kind of shape your training and your learning and development agenda around it to make sure you can plug any gaps. Makes performance management really easy because if you've done an OD workshop and someone sat there and told you what they do and what they're accountable for, they'll tell you how you measure it. So how do you measure that accountability that all you have to do from a performance management perspective is then set the target against the measure, mm -hmm. you know, from a what, but also then when you've got your behaviours framework, you can start to measure the frequency of which people observe those behaviours. It makes it really easy for leaders to lead and manage because they've now got a toolkit and a framework where they can say, I actually see some more negative behavioural indicators from you than I see of positive ones. We need to have a conversation. It makes it less personal. It's, come on, you help shape this framework. We've got to live it. Mm. So it makes leading and managing easier. It makes reward easier. So if I think of a case in point example, if I had to go out and benchmark a finance business partner or a HR business partner, you could get a salary range, Hakeem, from 30K to about 100K. But once you've really nailed that role profile in terms of the size of the accountability and the skill and the behavior required to deliver it, I can really hone in and say what that job's worth. So it then means your reward and recognition is fair, proportionate to the ask of that job. So I found that through delivering these programs now in multiple locations, it makes it easier for me to recruit because I can tell people what they're coming in and what they're buying and what the deal is 
you know, what's the EVP? What is the deal to come and work here? Mm-hmm. Not just in this job, but how can you navigate your way through to the next one and then progress your career and progress your pay? I've reduced turnover. When if we look at the cost of turnover my, in my current organisation, that 30% reduction, Hakeem, in that frontline care worker, that saved about a million pound in recruitment costs. It's also saved over about 1.2 million in overtime costs and about 2 million in reducing the need for contract labour because we're not having to constantly plug the gap of someone going and waiting to put someone else back in. So it, it'd, great, it'd be great to say it's all for altruistic reasons and wouldn't it be lovely because we all want to work somewhere that everybody loves to work. That is a, that is definitely an input, but an output is it would that every business I've been in has been in a much stronger financial position, either through sales growth because we've really ramped up the capability required to deliver it, as well as cost savings through reducing uh, attrition. And sickness absence because people feel motivated because they know what they've been asked to do and what the difference it can make. And regardless of whatever function done right, it removes duplication of, of, yeah. of effort and waste of work. We've all known those colleagues that have progressed from role to role and they're still doing an activity they did three jobs back. It puts a, a real line in the sand to say we're not doing that anymore and frees capability and capacity up to do the right things for organisations going forward. If I think of the studio campaign, Hakeem, that saved a million pound and all of that million was reinvested back in building IT capability. Because if you think, if you're a digital uh, retailer coming from a, you know, from a catalogue retailer, all the investment was in IT because IT and the web was the online shop. So we used all the savings from all the duplication of efforts and taking roles out of other, you know, teams you know, that just weren't added value or there was lots of duplication of effort, consolidated and centralised, and then used that money to reinvest in IT skills and DevOps capability to really take um, the the, the web forward. And it's really benefited in COVID because whilst we did that pre-COVID, what that meant was in a COVID world when all the shops were shut, studios had about 25% increase in growth year on year Mm -hmm. and largely attributable, I would say, to that OD programme that reshaped how it was going to deliver its services. So so real tangible benefits, which I think is important to to know. And and I know we've spoken about it before because you've obviously been been involved in quite a few businesses, Sharon, which which have been sold. And I remember I was having a conversation about actually the value and I think you had some empirical data, actually, about the value that's actually added to a business when selling, when you've got a proper, you know, organisational design and development programme in, in place. Well, if we think back to Acorn, when we transformed um, how we did recruitment and transformed re- attraction and retention. So we saved in year one, I think the last year there, we saved just shy of about 700,000 just in recruitment alone through improving um, who we were bringing in and improving the um, retention levels. Now, when you sell, that's 600,000 of pure hard cash, not arms and legs that could be cashed, pure hard cash. When you then sell that business for multiples of 11 times EBITDA, well, you just multiply 700,000 by 11 and you're into millions of pounds that you have been able to add back on to the bottom line if you're selling an organisation. That was pure saving straight on the bottom line. Mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to bring that up because I think a lot of people, I mean, you mentioned it, you both mentioned it actually, that, you know, people think, oh, well, you're doing it because it's nice and it's all very people and it's fluffy. Yeah, there is. And people do want to work in a nice place and it's and it is a good thing to do but it's also a practical thing to do if you're running a business because uh, as emma just said the amount of people i've seen who, who will tell you oh yeah i've got 15 years experience and actually what they've really got is one year's experience 15 times because they're not changed they're just yeah. doing the same thing over and over and over again and they're not moved on and, and that doesn't drive businesses forward so i think it's a, a really important thing and I'm, i was going to say on which to end but i haven't uh, and I'm not ending because I, I always have a few quick fire questions. Oh my uh, word! No, no, no! Don't worry, don't worry. Got then, maths, I, does it? I, maths I, science. These people, because then people have to then think of them on the feet. But there won't be anything to own with. So the first one is: what's the best organisational design process you've ever seen? Mine. <laughs> well, obviously, yeah. Well, I, yes, and I'm, and I'm sure Emma's is <laughs> as well. The best one obviously. she's ever seen. Or all the one she's worked in with Sharon, of course. Obviously, that was a really stupid question. Next. <laughs> is that really your answer, Sharon? I think it is, isn't it? No, 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 to be fair, if I've seen one, when I was at the co-op, I would say, and working with the Deloitte team, where I have service frameworks, they had taxonomies, which was kind of yeah. like a different take on service frameworks. So 
I found that quite useful working with, um, you know, one of the big four in terms of seeing how they shaped um, org designs for massive organisations. And to be honest with you, uh, they're not too dissimilar, Hakeem. I, I just have my own way of doing it that works for me and isn't maybe quite as corporate. And, and I don't work in organisations of that scale to kind of take it to that nth degree. But it was it was a great piece of work at the co-op. And I think Deloitte's delivered a great OD process, actually, in all fairness. Sure, they charge you enough for it as well. So, uh, Emma, on to you. In fairness, I'd echo that. I had the opportunity to work with co-op as well. And they were excellent in terms of, if you think what they went through over a period of time and the way that they reshaped with some pace. So, yeah. And then the converse, the worst. You don't, you don't have to necessarily name and shame unless you, unless you desire to do so. I'll name and shame and never get work in that brand again. No, I won't really. Um, I, well, to me, it's any organisation that thinks OD is about sitting with a piece of paper and drawing a structure and saying, I've done it. Yeah. They just need to be shot. Quite frankly, yeah. Well, I would. I'm assuming you agree with that, do you, Sharon? <laughs> yes. Uh, and then, best advice you've ever been given in the organisational uh, design development arena? My best bit of advice was it goes back to one of the bits ever said them before. We were doing the behaviours framework and we were consolidating all the feedback, all the sticky posters back in post-it pads, and everybody was saying thick-skinned. You know, you've got to be. You know, you've got to be quite tough to work here. And I was like, well, let's call it resilient. And actually Emma pushed back and went, but if we really change the words to be how you'd describe it, it's your framework, not theirs. You know, and a couple of times when I was like, well, can't we just wordsmith it and make it sound a bit nicer here and a bit more professional? It's like, but that isn't how the, no. that's not the tone of voice of how people speak around here. I mean, Hakeem, nobody goes to the pub and says, so come on then now, Hakeem, you know, tell me, you know, what's the EVP like at your place and how engaged are you? <laughs> no one says that. They say to you, all right, then how's it going at your place? Do you love your job or do you hate it? You know, let's just keep it in a language actually to how real people speak. So that's probably the best bit of advice I've got. Emma? And, and mine's never decouple culture from organisational design and development. The two are hand in hand. What we do and how we do it has got to be seen as a holistic approach. Um, I was speaking to an organisation recently who was saying, oh, oh, we want to do an OD programme, but we're not going to do the cultural piece. Impossible. Form follows, follows function. Yeah. They will line the two. Lovely. And then my penultimate one, advice you'd give to your younger self about success. Oh, younger self about success. Just believe in yourself. Create a network that you love and nurture that network. I'm really lucky to have worked with people and, and continue to have a relationship from my very, very early days and early 20s. Um, so nurture your network because what they can provide in terms of opportunity, thinking, learning, support, um, people are the most important thing. Agreed. The advice well. I'd give back to my younger self is HR isn't an island. I think because my first ever HR job was for a law firm and I think we weren't meant to get too close to some of our peers in terms of forming professional friendships and relationships and I'm if I look back now, I kind of left myself a little bit out on the periphery rather than being a fully, you know, fully in with the team. And it took me to go to another organisation where they said, come on, you're part of the SLT. Don't be out there on your own. If we're going out for a drink, come out for a drink. Or if we're going out and doing some team building events, you can be Sharon at work. Don't have to be the HR person with this HR professional veneer and just be yourself. And I think for too many years, I felt like I had to be this HR person that couldn't really get involved because I had to be on the sideline to maintain independence. Did you wear a neck scarf? I was going to say, what, 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 did it, what did this HR uh, That was before I met you, to be fair. That was before I met you. What, what, what does the HR professional veneer look like then, Sharon? <laughs> oh, only two oh, are lemonade, not a bottle. <laughs> it, it's been gone for such a long time now, I can't even remember. I'm now the most on PC HR person there is, I think it's fair to say. I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment on that, Sharon. <laughs> So, last question, and this is just me being nosy. What a, a most famous person you'd like to meet and why? Michelle Obama. Oh, that's what I was just about to say. Can't have her. I think no, no, you've got, you got yeah. <laughs> so no, no, Michelle Obama. I think she's amazing. 
just in terms of the way that she thinks about the world, about family, about the difference that people can make, about really challenging people's thinking. And she's got the most amazing sing-songy voice. So who doesn't? Oh, I'm doing reading. Listening to her audio book at the moment. Who else can I have then? Yeah, you have to have someone else. Winston Churchill then. Ah. I think he'd be really cool to listen to and to have a conversation with and say, so come on then, tell us what it was like in those war rooms, you know. So, yeah, Winston Churchill. Well, thank you very much for that. So it wasn't that bad, was it, Sharon? And you, and you managed to get through it uh, without um, being a shrinking violet, which I, ne- I knew you never would be. So thanks very much for that. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I'll be coming back to tap you both up to do uh, second sessions because I think that people are going to find it really entertaining. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having us. Bye then.